So much joy. There was much joy. Today we lit the joy candle, the third candle. And this is still a, a human tradition. On the Wednesday Advent uh, soup supper that we had, we learned that in Italy, their pink candle is the fourth candle that they lit instead of the third. But this is an awesome way to, to focus on the attributes of God. We have the joy candle, we have the peace candle, we have the love candle, and we have the hope candle. And they go, they go hand in hand, this joy and this hope. And because Jesus is with us, God is with us, we have these four attributes from God that Jesus gives to us, that we have through faith in him. In the, in the first week of Advent, we talked about Zechariah, and Luke 1 talks about Zechariah and his wife, Elizabeth. They were the parents of John the Baptist, who was sent to prepare the way for Jesus. And Zechariah was a priest when he received a visit from the angel. And the angel said, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you are to call him John. He will be a joy and a delight to you. And many will rejoice because of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. I'm going to talk a lot about joy today. And I'm going to ask Leah, she's our technical wizard. I'm going to ask her if on the online version, if she could put a counter on the screen that says, how many times I say joy, just to see what happens. Because I, I haven't even counted it. So Zechariah and Elizabeth were old. They were way past childbearing years. Zechariah gets this message. So besides this shock from talking to an angel, they always say, don't freak out. I'm an angel. They got that shock, but then Zechariah hears, wait, wait what? We're going to have a baby? And he has doubts. He can't imagine his wife having a baby. And as a result, his voice is taken away until the baby is born. And today I want to look a little bit closer at Elizabeth because in this story of God, she experiences joy, real joy in the midst of this miraculous event. But to understand her joy, I think we need to understand her pain a little bit better. For the ancient Jews, children were a tremendous blessing. Psalm 127 verse 3 tells us, children are a gift from the Lord, a reward from a mother's womb. And children allowed the family's heritage to pass on, or the business to pass on and on through the generations. Having more kids also gave you more hands when it was time to work in the fields or milk the cows. Or Some of you who grew up on a farm, you know that. I hear the stories all the time. So to be childless was an incredible source of frustration and sorrow and sadness and shame. And Elizabeth would have known this pain for many, many years. I assume she married Zechariah when she was still a teenager and had plans of the future on having babies. And maybe she made lists of baby names, what she was going to call her children. My dad wanted to name his boy, whoever he had, which boy he had. I have two brothers and me. He wanted to name us Herman so he could call us Herman the German. <laughs> and my mom said, no, that's not going to happen. So then it was Jill's and my turn to have a baby, and it was a struggle, and it was a challenge, and it was up and down. But when she was pregnant with Stephen, I suggested the name Boris, and she said, why Boris? And I said, because then his name would be Boris Gerloff instead of Boris Karloff, like that. <laughs> and she, fellas, you know when your wife tells you no and you know that's the end of the discussion? That's, that's the no that Jill gave me, so no Boris Gerloff. <laughs> For Elizabeth, year after year after year, her hope would have dwindled. 
she would have seen the writing on the wall that it's getting nearer and nearer to where I can't have any kids. And then it became the point where she knew that she could not have any kids. At some point, the social stigma would have stuck with her, that she is barren. That, and being called barren, this was a shameful mark. This, was, this wasn't good. She would not be considered as worthy or as honored in, as other women. And yet, as she kept this pain deep under the surface, she and Zechariah still remained faithful to the Lord. Luke describes them like this in Luke 1, 6. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. This is how they plan to live out the rest of their lives. We're going to follow the Lord. He is our God. But then, God comes in and he changes the plans. Has that ever happened to any of you? God comes and you think you're doing this thing, and God says, no, you're going to go this way. I thought I was going to be in law enforcement. God said, no, no, I think I want you in the ministry. It took me a while to understand that, but God likes changing plans. If we read through Scripture, we need to be flexible a little bit. So on Zechariah is a priest. He's working in the temple. On just an ordinary day, Zechariah is at work. The angel Gabriel shows up with this miraculous message. Luke 1, verses 13 to 20. The, Gabriel says, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard. And your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great before the Lord. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. And in verse 18, Jeremiah says, uh, what? <laughs> what? How, how can I know that this is true? Because my wife and I are old. And the angel says to him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I was sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. And now you will be silent and unable to speak until the day that these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time. I've been focusing this Advent on the people. These were real, human, everyday people that God's working through. So this happens to Zechariah. When he gets home, he, isn't, he, he can't tell his wife, what the angel said. He would either have to have written it down if, if Elizabeth could read or use signs and gestures, gestures to get the point across. So I'm thinking like ancient Pictionary or ancient charades. He's trying to communicate what happened. Could you imagine? And Elizabeth must have thought that she was getting the wrong message. What do you mean we are having a baby? But soon she is pregnant, and in Luke one twenty five it says, The Lord has done this for me. In these days he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. What's interesting about the text is, is what Elizabeth does next. For the next five months... Elizabeth chooses to hide out. And I wonder why. She's kind of secluded. And I'm wondering, maybe the other women wouldn't have believed her until she started showing. Maybe she was suffering alongside her husband, who could not speak. So she remained In her sixth month of pregnancy, Elizabeth 
experiences a deep encounter with, with joy when she meets with her cousin Mary, who's now pregnant with Jesus. And we discussed last week that Mary had left her home shortly after her own angelic visit, and she came to stay with Elizabeth for three months. In Luke 1.41, it says, As soon as Mary arrives, Elizabeth's baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. This is a sudden end to Elizabeth's seclusion and silence. Her joy overflows, and she, she greets Mary with this beautiful and insightful blessing. Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? And then Luke, verse 42, As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. Joy was flowing. You can read the joy in this text. Joy's bubbling over. It's contagious. So Mary bursts out in her own song of praise and thanksgiving as she responds to the miracle that's happening through her. And finally, finally Elizabeth is affirmed. She's going to have a baby. Elizabeth understood. And Mary, Mary and Elizabeth understood one another, even though there's not a whole lot of dialogue that goes between them. Do you have a, a friend like that, where you guys are just on the same page all the time? My best friend John from Sonora, he and I are like that. I can call him up and he knows exactly. I haven't talked to him for like two or three months, but he knows what's going on somehow, and I know what's going on. In Boy Scouts, we would do campouts together, and he and I, in the same tent, we would stay up till, you know, two, three, four in the morning, keeping all the other scouts up, and finally get yelled at, and then we'd wake up at 6.30, and John and I are, <laughs> Andy, Andy knows the kind of kids those are. We'd wake up, and we'd be fine. We're full of energy. Why are the rest of you so grumpy? What's the problem? So there's rules in Boy Scouts. You, you can't start a fire unless you have the authority to do it. You can't chop wood. So they added a rule that Gary and John cannot stay in the same tent. <laughs> that was a formal rule. <laughs> Mary and Elizabeth understood each other and shared a joy that could no longer be contained. And when Elizabeth gives birth to John three months later, the joy of her miracle spreads throughout her village and her family. Luke 1.57 says, Her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown her great mercy, and they shared her joy. This joy. And perhaps there's no greater joy than a mother holding her new baby. For Elizabeth, that must have been especially overwhelming. She had already written this part of her life off, that this couldn't happen. She was experiencing a miracle, and this miracle was healing a lifetime of shame and pain. And it was only the beginning of the miracles that she would see in her lifetime. What would you give to have that joy? What would you give to see the scars and the shame that you've had in your life to see it evaporate? All those pains, meaningless. Because the joy that Elizabeth experiences is, is available to us. That's why Jesus came to us, to heal us. The Apostle Peter writes in 1 Peter 1, verses 8 and 9, Though you have not seen Jesus, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Think about that joy. 
this joy, it runs much deeper than happiness. We love to be happy. I love to be. Most people love to be happy. I met some people that they don't, it doesn't look like being happy is on their priority list. But we like to be happy. But maybe, maybe it, for those people, happiness is overrated because happiness goes up and down and up and down depending on what the circumstances are. Happiness is fleeting. Joy includes happiness, but it's much deeper. Joy permeates our being. Joy reaches us down to our souls. Joy looks like the birth of a son or daughter or your wedding day. Joy is, is being declared free of cancer, being healed from an injury. Joy is hope fulfilled, especially when it's based in a relationship with our creator. Joy comes from God. Jesus is the source of our joy. Peter calls it an inexpressible and glorious joy is what we are receiving from Jesus, from the Christ, from the Messiah. And with this promise of eternal life beyond this world, we have great joy. In Pastor Mueller's memorial service, we celebrated that he is with the Creator. He is with the Father. He is home in heaven with much joy. In John 16, verse 22, Jesus explains to his disciples about his his coming death and the resurrection, Jesus says, now is your time of grief, but I will see you again, and you will rejoice, and no one will take away your joy. No one will take away your joy. As we celebrate the Advent season, we focus on joy. We look in the past at all the prophecies that told us the Messiah is coming. We look to the future because Jesus Christ will come again. And in the presence, we are satisfied with Jesus Christ here with us now. We receive him along with the word. We receive him through our baptism. We receive him through the Lord's Supper. So as we turn our eyes to Jesus, remember this hope. Keep this hope alive. Hope doesn't waver. Hope in the Lord does not waver. Like the prophet Nehemiah, he was the Jewish leader that he faced all kinds of obstacles to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. And he shares the joy of the Lord is your strength. This is why we can be joyful. And we compared it to happiness a little bit ago, but if we could differentiate happiness and joy, it would be this. Joy defies our circumstances. You can be sad and yet joyful. You can be crying because of a diagnosis or an injury or bad news, yet you can be joyful. You can be unhappy with something in this world and yet remain joyful. Happiness comes and goes. Joe, joy sticks with us no matter what the hardship is. James says it really well in James 1 verse 2. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Joy understands that it's more than meets the eye. It's more than we can explain. Joy is our hope. Our hope is God is going to make everything right one day. We will all be in heaven because we believe in Jesus Christ as our Lord and you will be fully healed, and we will be without sin. 
and we won't have, well, maybe there will be a 24-hour news cycle, but it's all going to be joy. <laughs> Perfect love, free. In Advent and in Christmas, there's a miracle that has come to us that God, our eternal God, who lives outside of our world, outside time and space, Jesus came down to our broken world to be with us. This is what we celebrate in Advent. Our expectation and anticipation that Jesus is coming. We're blessed because we li live in the 21st century now. Jesus has already come the first time. He shared God's plan with us. We know what we need to be in heaven. Jesus with us. This is the message from the angel who long ago announced to the shepherds, these terrified shepherds, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Jesus God with us has brought us great joy. So before we close today, I want to look at one more aspect of joy that we can apply as we continue through our Advent season. Joy can be a choice. Because you can certainly reject joy. You can reject all the other emotions. We've talked about Mary in previous weeks, and we talked about her today as she spent time with Elizabeth. And remember when Mary showed up at Elizabeth's house, Elizabeth was overcome with joy. And this joy spread to Mary. And when it did, the beginning of Mary's expression went like this. My soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior for he has been mindful of the humble estate of his servant. From now on, all generations will be, call me blessed. These are important words. A key word is rejoices. The active form of the verb joy. Mary is choosing and embracing joy in this role that she has of being the mother to Jesus. I mean, she didn't sign up for this. God didn't ask her. I don't know. If he would have asked her, if he would have asked you, will you carry the son of my son in your belly, the perfect one? I imagine most people would freak out. But in Mary's words, we see her response. She rejoices. She chooses joy. She sees God's bigger picture of everything, and she embraces her role. So when we're in bad seasons in life, we have the same opportunity. We can, we can own this joy, this joy that comes only from God. We can embrace it, or we can reject it. And the two questions I ask are, what would Jesus want me to do? What would Satan want me to do? Jesus would want you to buy into this joy, choose joy in the Lord, make this a season of joy. So let's rejoice as we wait for Christ's return, as we wait for him to come back and make everything right. God is with us. Joy is with us through Christ. Share this joy with everyone you come across. I'm going to leave with one more verse. It's from Psalm 5, verse 11. But let all who take refuge in you, Lord, be glad. Let them ever sing for joy. Spread your protection over them, that those who love your name may rejoice in you. Amen.